Dark money by design can be impossible to trace, but people instinctively know it when their voices are being drowned out and big corporations always seem to come out on top. They can tell when the ad on their television was put up by some fake front group they've never heard of. Floods of dark money caused this mess so we can fix it. The Disclose Act, first introduced by Leader Schumer in 2010 and reintroduced by me and every Congress since, will fix this. Even the Citizens United justices recognized that unlimited political spending without transparency would be corrupting. That they got right. We've seen a tsunami of slime distort our politics and corrode our democracy since. What the justices got wrong, indisputably factually wrong, is their unlimited money tsunami being either transparent or independent. The wreckage from the dark money aftermath of Citizens United is staggering. Dark money political spending went from under $5 million in 2006 to more than a billion in 2020. Mega donors and special interests had a bonanza. Billionaire political spending increased by a factor of 70, from $17 million for the 2008 election to $1.2 billion for 2020. In 2018, super PACs and other dark money groups collectively outspent even candidates' own campaigns in 16 federal races. If you think things are different, well, they are. Academic studies found that economic elites and business interests have huge influence on government policy, while average citizens have little or none. Whatever the American people want, the big donor interests now win nearly every time. Look at climate change. Before Citizens United, there was a steady heartbeat in the Senate of bipartisan climate bills. John McCain ran for president with a solid climate platform. With Citizens United, that heartbeat flatlined. The fossil fuel industry used its unlimited dark money weaponry to stamp out bipartisanship, creating a lost decade of legislative failure for which I fear we will pay very dearly. Far-right special interests even turned their dark money guns on the federal judiciary. They funded a $580 million secretive network to pack the courts with judges selected to greenlight donor-friendly policies and to run multi-million dollar ad campaigns to keep those confirmations on track. This network involves dozens of front groups, some of which are mere fictitious names for other secretive front groups. Now, we have a court gone wild. In a matter of days, the newly radicalized court overturned Roe v. Wade, manufactured new polluter-friendly legal doctrines, and threw out centuries-old gun safety regulations. All of it wildly unpopular with most people. Dark money groups funded and organized the rally before the January 6th attack on the Capitol and perpetuate the big lie today. Bad enough. But behind and beside the Trump mob's violent insurrection attempt has run a slow motion coup d'etat by secretive special interests surreptitiously, incrementally taking over government power. Madam Chair, left to, rot, left to fester, dark money will rot the very foundation of our republic. Remember, justices who signed off on Citizens United conceded dark money was corrupting. That part was eight to one. We need to pass the Disclose Act so citizens can see who is spending big money in politics, donors who spend over $10,000. Even foreign enemies can now try to corrupt us through dark money channels. After all, secret is secret. And by the way, the American people love this idea. Poll after poll shows Americans overwhelmingly, by margins of 85 to 90 percent, want this. Even Republicans criticize dark money. Well, we should all have a chance. Republicans should have a chance to join us in ending it. If we get rid of the damned stuff, this horrible decade of dark money corruption can come to an end, and Congress can begin to serve America again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Senator Whitehouse, and thank you for reminding us that actually the, the justices anticipated that we would do something on disclosure and um, and disclaimers, and uh, sadly that has not happened when it comes to the dark money, but 
um, one day we will get this done, and this hearing is the beginning of that. Um, and I want to thank you for your long advocacy to get it done. All right. Um, Senator Schumer is on his way. I know he's going to uh, give a statement. But in the meantime, I'm going to call up um, the uh, witnesses. Um, if you want to come up, and when Senator Schumer comes, we'll have him give a statement. But for now, why don't we swear everyone in and get started? OK. Um, Senator Haggerty will introduce one of the witnesses, and I'll introduce three. I think two are remote. Is that right? And two, two are here. Um, uh, before I do this, I want to ask uh, unanimous consent to enter into the record a statement from Senator Van Hollen, as well as a few letters of support uh, from democracy reform groups and others in support of the Disclose Act, including from the Campaign Legal Center, Public Citizen, and End Citizens United. Without objection, the documents uh, will be entered into the record. Uh, before we uh, introduce the witnesses, I'm going to let Senator Schumer come in and he has a lot going on, and um, say, a, say a few words. And Senator Whitehouse just spoke. Senator Schumer did a very, very good job. So we, will, we appreciate you uh, joining us today as a member of the committee. I think I'm correct that this is the only m committee that you and Senator McConnell are on. That is correct. That I think he exactly. may still be on approach, but I'm, <laughs> this is my only one. All right. Well, well thank, you, thank you, Senator Klobuchar, and thank you not only for holding this hearing, but the Rules Committee has been a great beacon on campaign finance and cleaning up so much of the politics in America that needs cleaning up, and I thank you for your great leadership on this issue. I also do want to thank Senator Whitehouse. I saw him in the hallway. He said, you missed my speech. I said, I hope mine is half as good, so let's hope. Um, so why are we here today? Because across our democracy, the disease of dark money has spread unchecked like a cancer. Today I'm proud to join with my colleagues to support the Disclose Act, which I've long championed and I promised to bring on the floor for a vote. In free and fair elections, one person, one vote, American voters alone should have the power to determine our nation's leaders without fear that their voices will be drowned out by powerful elites or special interests. Whether someone is rich or poor, young or old, well-connected or otherwise, none of that should have any bearing on their ability to affect the final outcome of the democratic process. But we all know that today that ideal is not reality in America. From the moment Chief Justice Roberts and the radical conservative majority on the Supreme Court handed down their opinion in Citizens United, one of the most awful decisions that we've ever had from the court, taking the, twisting the First Amendment into a argument to help special interests and powerful moneyed interests, which it was never intended to be. Billions of dollars in dark money spending has poured into our elections. And Senate Republicans, particularly the Republican Senate leader, who I wish had come today, I thought he might, have blocked practically every attempt to get rid of dark money at great expense to our democracy. Over a decade later, trust in our democracy is eroded. Dark money groups have taken advantage of a megaphone that's drowned out the voices of everyday Americans. And the problem is not just limited to our elections. Dark money has corroded the judicial nomination process as special interest groups spend tens of millions to push extremist judges onto the federal bench. And the worst part, much of this money is raised in secret. The Disclose Act operated, over, operated off a simple premise. A healthy democracy is a transparent democracy one where billionaires and mega corporations don't have a free pass to exploit loopholes in campaign finance in order to spend billions in anonymous, underlying anonymous campaign contributions. That is the antithesis of democracy, someone having unequal power because they have huge amounts of money and no one even knowing what they're doing. The bill asserts very plainly that Americans deserve to know who is trying to influence our election. It pays tribute to the words of Justice Louis Brandeis, Sunlight is said to be the greatest disinfectant. This shouldn't be a Democratic or Republican view. It didn't used to be early on. It should be bipartisan through and through. Sadly, it's not. When was the last time any of us heard voters cheering on dark money in our elections? Who here honestly thinks it's better for billionaires and special interests to buy elections in secret rather than face the healthy scrutiny of the American people? Passing this bill has never been more important than it is today. 
as MAGA Republicans pass sweeping voter suppression laws, it's more urgent than ever to tilt the playing field back in favor of the American people and restore faith in the democratic process. So, if you agree that the American people have a right to know who's trying to influence their elections, support the Disclose Act. If you agree that billions of dollars in anonymous campaign contributions every year is not a function of a healthy democracy, support the Disclose Act. If you agree that Americans' representatives should have only one boss, the people, and not special, special interests, then support the Disclose Act. Democracy cannot prosper without transparency. I strongly support this legislation so we can safeguard our electoral process and keep the dream of our founders alive in this century. I thank the chair, the ranking member, and all the other members for their time and letting me speak now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leader Schumer. Um, now, next up, our witnesses. Uh, first, Commissioner Jeff Mangan, uh, who's with us remotely. He is, has served as Montana's Commissioner of Political Practices since 2017, overseeing the integrity and transparency of elections in the state. He was confirmed to that position by a bipartisan 48 to 1 vote of the Montana State Senate. Sounds pretty good. Uh, previously, Mr. Mangan served for four years as a state rep and four years as a state senator in Montana. He holds a bachelor's degree from Montana State University. Second, Ms. Virginia Case Solomon. Uh, she is the chief executive officer of the League of Women Voters of the United States and has held that position since 2018. Uh, previously, she worked at CASA, helping to manage a national immigrant rights organization. She holds a bachelor's degree from the University of Maryland. We thank you for joining us here. Uh, next up, Dan Wiener, who is the director of the Elections and Government Program at the Brennan Center for Justice at NYU School of Law, where he worked since 2014. Previously, he served as a senior counsel uh, to Commissioner Ellen Weintraub at the Federal Election Commission. He holds a bachelor's degree with honors from Brown and a law degree from Harvard. Next, uh, Senator Haggerty, please introduce the next witness. Thank you, Chairwoman Klobuchar. Our next witness is going to appear remotely as well. David Keating is the president of the Institute for Free Speech. The Institute for Free Speech is the nation's largest organization dedicated solely to protecting First Amendment political speech rights. In leading numerous nonprofit groups throughout his career, Mr. Keating has been a tireless advocate for Americans' First Amendment rights to freely speak, to freely assemble, to publish, and petition the government. He's also been a leader in protecting the rights of Americans to associate and join together in political advocacy. Thank you, thank you for joining us today, Mr. Keating. Okay, thank you. If our witnesses uh, could now stand and raise their right hand. Uh, do you swear that the testimony you will give before the committee shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. Thank you. Uh, you can be seated and yes. we'll begin. Uh, we'll begin. I heard that. Very good. Uh, remote people. Uh, we're going to begin with Commissioner um, Mangan. You're recognized for your testimony for five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman Klobuchar, Ranking Member Hegarty, members of the committee. I'm honored to participate in today's hearing. I appear to discuss one state's experience with campaign finance transparency and disclosure as you consider legislation to provide additional disclosure requirements to the Federal Election Campaign Act. I will briefly describe the role of Montana COPP specific to campaign finance disclosure against the backdrop of my state's unique and storied past. Common threats of fierce independence, bipartisan traditions, and citizen-driven reform have profoundly influenced and shaped state law and continue to do so. Transparency and accountability become part of the fabric of Montana state institutions and elections. First and foremost, the office I represent is and always has been an independent and nonpartisan office. Following passage of the Federal Election Campaign Act and ratification of the 72 Montana Constitution, the 1975 Citizen Legislature established the Office of Commissioner of Campaign Finance and Practices, now the COPP, to establish and enforce disclosure and reporting of money used to influence Montana elections. Montana's governor appoints the commissioner from a list submitted by a bipartisan legislative nomination committee, and the state Senate confirms the nominee. In 2017, when I was appointed by then Governor Steve Bullock, a Democrat, the Senate consisted of 32 Republicans and 18 Democrats, the second largest Republican majority in decades. The Senate confirmed my nomination by a vote of 49 to 1, a testament once again to Montana's bipartisan approach to campaign finance reporting and disclosure. 
The written testimony I have submitted provides additional details on how the COPP carries out its statutory responsibility. Convergence of events during the turn of the century helps illustrate how Montana started down the path, which it still walks, to regulate spending in elections and ensure that spending is public information. That path is paved with copper. Expansive deposits of copper, unearthed in the late 1800s in Butte, became increasingly valuable as industrialization and the widespread use of electricity swept the nation. And even today, Butte is often called the richest hill on earth. Three prominent figures who would become known as the Copper Kings capitalized on and controlled that wealth. When Montana achieved statehood in 1889, two of the Copper Kings, William A. Clark and Marcus Daly, fight ferociously for the new U.S. Senate seat and spared no expense bribing politicians and judges and purchasing newspapers to propagate scandalous stories about each other. Clark emerged the victor, and as the U.S. Senate was on the verge of rejecting his nomination, he resigned, only to run again in 1901. Having failed to fulfill campaign promises, it was said of him among his colleagues in Washington, if you took away the whiskers and the scandal, there'd be nothing left. Clark Daly's scandal and other schemes to purchase public office led in 1912 to the passage by a three-to-one margin of the Citizens Initiated Corrupt Practices Act, prohibiting corporate contributions to and expenditures on candidate elections. Subsequent citizen-initiated measures to limit campaign contributions and expenditures would follow in 1994, 96, and 2012, all passing by significant margins. Through the years, the 1912 Corrupt Practices Act had remained largely intact. Standing a challenge in 2011, in which the Montana Supreme Court held that unlimited corporate donations creates a dominating impact on the Montana political process and inevitably minimizes the impact of individual Montana citizens. U.S. Supreme Court decisions, however, would significantly alter the landscape of campaign finance law and ultimately result in the demise of that portion of Montana's Corrupt Practices Act. 2010, the U.S. Supreme Court held in Citizens United that corporations and other outside groups can spend unlimited money on elections. Two years later, in American Tradition, Tradition Partnership v. Bullock, the court held there can be no serious doubt that its decision in Citizens Unite that political speech does not lose First Amendment protection simply because of sources of corporation applied to Montana state law. Three years after the Supreme Court's ruling, the 2015 Montana legislature enacted and Governor Steve Bullock signed the Montana Disclose Act. The act has been lauded as one of the most robust campaign finance laws in the country. Notably, the legislation requires disclosure reports by entities participating in Montana's elections, regardless of their tax status. The state had again flashed its bipartisan stripes with the measure sponsored by a Republican senator, enacted by a Republican-controlled legislature, and signed by a Democratic governor. Since statehood, Montana citizens have grappled with the ramifications of money in elections while holding fiercely to protecting the public's constitutional right to know. Campaign finance reporting and disclosure laws, excuse me, campaign finance and disclosure laws will continue to evolve as they should through legislation and in the courts. But regardless of which political party holds sway in the executive and legislative branches of Montana, the state's history has shown that its citizens will continue to expect no less than absolute transparency from its candidates and those who seek to help place them in positions of public trust. Thank you, and I look forward to your question. Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate your testimony. And then we have, uh, next up, we have um, Mr. Keating. I know he's remote. You want to? Sorry. That's okay. Uh, chair, Go ahead. Can you hear me now? I yeah, hear? we can hear you well. In fact, we might want to right. turn yeah, down turns. a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll let, I'll let they'll, the tech, they'll deal uh, with it. That. Yes, exactly. You don't have to worry. Over. Okay. Uh, Chairwoman Klobuchar, um, Ranking Member Haggerty today, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. First, I want to, before I get started, I want to commend the committee for the quick action that you did both in 2020, I believe, and this year uh, to confirm or recommend confirmation of nominees to the Federal Election Commission. I really commend you for acting promptly on that. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, so I do wanna speak about free speech. It's obviously fundamental to American democracy. The First Amendment says we have the right to freely speak 
Oh, he just turned. Um, you just turned yourself off there. Now it was on the words "freely speak," so we're gonna okay. just go back to that sentence. That okay. was really that was an interesting thing to make us focus. So very good. <laughs> um, well, it's very important. Government and society can't be improved without free speech, of course. And as we've seen around the world, free speech can mean the difference between liberty and tyranny. S-443 would harm our free speech rights and harm our democracy. It would suppress speech about government and candidates, threaten our privacy if we speak or join groups, and impose heavy burdens for organizing. Now, among the effects are uh, of S-443, it would force groups and the FEC to publish misinformation. It would compel groups to say they support or oppose members of Congress, even if they do neither. It would make some disclaimers longer than the time or space available for the ad. It would publicize, it would publicly expose the names and addresses of many supporters of nonprofit causes, putting Americans at risk of harassment and retaliation for their beliefs. Now, these legal and compliance costs will force many smaller groups to self-censor. It would definitely increase the cost of criticizing the government. Let me give you one example of the many absurd requirements in this bill. Let's assume an environmental group, let's call it Americans for the Environment, wants to sponsor a 30-second radio ad calling on senators in a certain state to take action on climate change. Here's a disclaimer that would have to be read. Paid for by Americans for the Environment, cleanenvironment.org, not authorized by any candidate or candidate's committee. I am John Doe, the president of Americans for the Environment, and Americans for the Environment approves this message. Top two funders are first name one, last name one, and first name two, last name two. Now that disclaimer took about 30, 18 of the 30 seconds, and it takes away from the group's climate change message. The radio ads are 30 seconds, so the government, in this case, would be taking over half the ad. Now, to justify passage, we've heard a lot today about dark money, but no one really knows exactly what that term means here, and it's not shining much light. So let's start with a few basic facts. There are currently more laws mandating public disclosure of politically related spending than any time in our nation's histories. Candidates, political parties, and PACs disclose all their donors beyond the most de minimis amounts. Federal law also requires reporting of independent expenditures over $250. So given this extensive disclosure, it's a misnomer to speak of undisclosed spending. Really, what we have is a system in which some of the spending, some of the spending occurs with less information about spenders, members, donors, and internal operations than some people would like to see. But how big an issue is this? Well, in fact, in 2020, we saw less so-called dark money than in any election since Citizen United. It peaked in 2012 with $312 million spent, which was 5% of that year's total campaign spending. This past election, dark money was just $102 million, and that's under 1% of the $14 billion price tag spent by all candidates, PACs, and parties. And even that overstates the issue because many of the largest spenders are well known, like NARAL Pro Choice America and National Association of Realtors. If the question may be, why not seek still more information? The answer is with almost everything else, even good things, that after a point you have rising costs and diminishing returns. Few people argue, for example, that we should turn our nation into a police state to try to stamp out the last 5% of crime. So finally, I'd like to say we cannot overlook the costs and privacy that come with excessive compulsory disclosure. These costs with this, which the Supreme Court has repeatedly struck down excessive disclosure laws in cases involving union organizers like Thomas V. Collins, civil rights organizations like NAACP versus Alabama, and NAACP versus Button, Bates versus Little Rock, picketers, pamphleteers, missionaries, charities, and yes, even organizations making partisan express advocacy communications to voters in the Buckley versus Vallejo case. S-443, if enacted, will certainly be challenged on constitutional grounds, but I hope 
that the committee will instead show consideration for the constitutional rights at stake, the privacy and other interests at stake that would justify such a challenge. Let's keep in mind the purpose of disclosure is to allow citizens to monitor their government. That's why we have disclosure of contributions to candidates and political parties controlled by the candidates. It's not to allow the government to monitor the political activity of its citizens. Please recognize the real costs that compulsory disclosure has for unpopular speakers and new, often unpopular ideas. These are ideas that may in the future become quite popular. This was the case with many causes throughout history, including the civil rights movement and relatively recently, the movement for same-sex marriage. We cannot seriously discuss this issue today without recognizing the tremendous cost that the excessive zeal for full disclosure is already having on public confidence in government. Rightly or wrongly, millions of Americans already believe their government's inappropriately spying on them. Millions believe the IRS is being used as a tool to harass critics. In fact, just in the last few weeks, we've seen headlines in the New York Times expressing concern about the audits of former FBI Director James Comey and his colleague. The best way to give people a voice and to protect democracy is to protect and enhance the rights to free speech, free press, assembly, and petition guaranteed by the First Amendment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Keating. Uh, next up, uh, Ms. Virginia K. Solomon. Chairwoman Klobuchar, Ranking Member Haggerty, and members of the Senate Committee on Rules and Administration, thank you so much for uh, the opportunity to testify today on the Disclose Act. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan organization that was founded over 100 years ago by leaders of the women's suffrage movement. We are an issue-focused, activist, and grassroots organization that believes voters must play a critical role in our democracy. Since 1920, the League has worked to deliver on our mission to empower voters and defend democracy. Today, the League has a presence in nearly every community across the country with more than 750 chapters spread across 50 states and the District of Columbia. The League has supported the Disclose Act for more than a decade because we believe that our democracy is strengthened when Americans are encouraged to engage in civic participation. We believe Americans deserve to know who is trying to influence their vote. As an organization, the League has fought for nearly five decades to combat the influences of money on politics. Our work reflects our ongoing priority to promote open and honest elections and maximize participation in the political process. Voters have the right to know who is making large campaign contributions to influence elections and when contributions are made, we believe it must be done with transparency. The Disclose Act accomplishes this fundamental purpose by requiring expenditures and donations of $10,000 and above to be reported. Every day the League works to inform voters about the issues they care about by providing critical voter services to the public. In the last two years, almost 6.5 million users came to vote411.org the League's award-winning nonpartisan website for election information that voters need. The site provides registration tools, candidate guides, and resources about what they need to take with them when they go to vote. As an organization, we work to simplify the voting process for voters to make their individual voting plans. These actions make the voting process understandable and accessible, which break down, breaks down barriers to participation. However, it should not fall to organizations such as the League to provide information and ensure transparency in our elections. The law should require public disclosure when it comes to dark money groups seeking to influence elections. Transparency is a baseline requirement for a healthy democracy. According to a nationwide study conducted by the Campaign Legal Center, about 60% of voters believe that major changes are needed to our country's campaign, campaign finance system. The majority of voters surveyed also believe that the money spent by special interest groups has a direct impact on their personal lives. 
And we have seen that we have seen that without transparency, candidates and election officials fall into the trap of valuing donors and their priorities above the needs of voters and everyday citizens. Such deprioritization of voters only breeds distrust in the republic and those who lead it. There should be little question that this runs counter to the spirit of our democracy and a government of, by, and for the people. Dark money spans the political spectrum and is used by both Democrats and Republicans to boost candidates. In fact, in 2020, a majority of outside funding was spent to promote Democratic candidates. Open Secrets, the nation's premier research group tracking money in US politics, estimates that $1 billion in dark money was spent in the 2020 elections. Shell companies, outside groups, and political nonprofits funneled millions of dollars to super PACs, which helps to hide the individual source of donations. Secret campaign money, no matter the party, promotes unbridled power and has no place in American democracy. It undermines the role of the voter and corrupts the election process. The League will continue to fight to ensure that voters can make decisions free from influence of dark money and special interest groups. We strongly support the Disclose Act and urge this committee to take up this legislation and advance it to the full Senate for a vote as quickly as possible. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify on this important legislation, and I look forward to taking your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Wiener. Thank you, uh, <coughs> Chair Klobuchar. Excuse me. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair Klobuchar, Ranking Member Haggerty, and Senators. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to testify today in support of S-443, the Disclose Act of 2021. I co-direct the Elections and Government Program at the Brennan Center for Justice at NYU School of Law. The Brennan Center is an independent, nonpartisan law and policy institute that works to strengthen democracy for all Americans. Prior to coming to the Brennan Center, I served as a senior counsel to, the, to a commissioner at the Federal Election Commission and as a lawyer at a major DC law firm. Altogether, I have well over a decade of experience working in the fields of campaign finance and election law. In Citizens United, the Supreme Court swept aside century-old restrictions on corporate campaign spending and ushered in the era of super PACs. I, like many, have been highly critical of the decision. But the court did embrace at least one type of regulation in that ruling, campaign transparency. In fact, the court appears to have assumed that the sources of all the new corporate spending it permitted would be fully disclosed, proclaiming that, and I quote, a campaign finance system that pairs corporate independent expenditures with effective disclosure has not existed before today. Now, of course, the court's assumption that transparency already existed, and I must say like many of its assumptions about the effects of its decisions on American democracy, was wrong. Although an eight to one majority in Citizens United resoundingly endorsed the constitutionality of campaign finance disclosure rules, the court's action in permitting many unregulated entities to spend money on campaigns, of course, ushered, unleashed a wave of new secret spending in US elections, what today we often refer to as dark money. Dark money groups who keep their donors secret have reported spending well over a billion dollars on federal elections since 2010. Critically, most of that spending is concentrated in a few specific races, where, as has been noted already, it can sometimes account for a third or more of total money spent. And as the chair noted, reported dark money spending is really only the tip of the iceberg. It does not include funds that dark money groups funnel to super PACs that nominally disclose their donors, nor the many types of election spending that are simply not subject to any reporting requirements, such as most online campaign ads. And as we noted, the nonpartisan Center for Responsive Politics has estimated the total dark money spending in just the 2020 election cycle exceeded $1 billion. So the proposed legislation offers a tailored response to this problem. It requires organizations spending $10,000 or more on federal uh, campaign activities to disclose donors who themselves gave $10,000 or more. And I want to note that $10,000 is 50 times the threshold we have for disclosure to candidate campaigns, 50 times. 
And the Act also contains a variety of other exceptions, including for donors who do not want their money used for campaign spending and for those for whom disclosure poses a genuine safety risk. So this is a common sense approach, and it's one that will bring important benefits. It will arm the voting public with knowledge about who is seeking to influence their votes and what those interests want from the government, allowing voters to make, as Citizens United put it, quote, informed choices in the political marketplace. Greater electoral transparency is also an important safeguard against corruption, and it will help prevent evasion of other rules, including curbs on foreign interference, which I hope we'll talk about today. Because that is the other piece of this bill. It shores up protections against meddling in the U.S. political process by foreign governments, wealthy corporations, and oligarchs. And here, too, while purporting not to undermine these safeguards, the Supreme Court has actually made them far easier to evade, for example, through shell corporations that can be used to funnel illicit money to super PACs. In a time of resurgent authoritarianism around the world, with hostile actors looking to benefit from instability and division in the United States, reinforcing guardrails to prevent manipulation of our political process could not be more critical. And so in conclusion, I just want to emphasize that these are not partisan issues. Overwhelming majorities of Americans across party and ideological persuasion support campaign transparency. Nor will closing dark money loopholes benefit one party or the other. Indeed, as my co-panelists noted, while Republicans benefited more from dark money in some past election cycles, in 2020, left-leaning dark money groups outspent their conservative counterparts by a more than two-to-one margin. Ultimately, this is not about helping Democrats or Republicans. It is about making sure that all Americans have the means to hold political leaders and those working to elect them accountable. Um, this is far from the only step we believe that Congress must take to safeguard American democracy, but truly I believe it should be one of the easiest. We urge you to pass this important bill, and I, of course, look forward to your questions. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, all of you. Uh, I'm going to cede my first five minutes here to Senator King, who's been diligently here from the beginning, and uh, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I, first, I want to clear up a, a factual question with Mr. Keating. Um, the testimony we've had from our other witnesses is that over a billion dollars of dark money, that is unaccounted money, undisclosed money, was contributed in the 2020 election. You had a much lower number. What's What's the difference? Uh, groups are disclosed, uh, you know, Americans for Greener Grass, but there isn't disclosure of the donors, and that's really the issue here. So, Mr. Keating, is, is there a factual problem here? Give me a brief uh, explanation of the difference between your figure, which was much lower, and a billion dollars. Well, I don't know where the other numbers are coming from. I can just tell you where we get our numbers, and this these are groups, um, according to Open Secrets, that are not PACs and uh, are not disclosing their donors when they're making independent expenditures or electioneering communications. Now, I know the, the Wesleyan, uh, there's, there's some Wesleyan project uh, that has put out numbers and they are counting things that are not uh, campaign related, in my view. They're counting uh, ads that talk about, you know, legislation pending before Congress during an election year. So if you if you expand the amount of time that you're going to cover communications about policy issues that may mention members of Congress in them, you can come up with different numbers. So I think one of the things uh, that would, would be useful is to have everyone agree on what numbers we're, we're all talking about here. Well, I, I think that would be useful, but the, the fundamental point that you're making is that uh, disclosure would be a, a, a dampening or chilling of, of free speech. Um, every day I have to go over and vote, and it's very interesting how the Senate voting process works. Uh, the first half of the people that vote, uh, the clerk gets up and reads all their names. And then everybody that votes after that period, after they've gone through the alphabet, the clerk reads their name uh, allowed when they vote. The whole idea is that the public knows exactly who votes. <laughs> I'm subject to criticism for some of my votes. Uh, it might even chill my free speech. Do you think Senate votes should be secret? No, absolutely not. But 
I What's think the difference. What's the difference? What's oh, the it, difference I, between because I I voluntarily er, er, entered the political sphere. I understand that. But a person who contributes a million dollars to a political campaign to try to defeat or or seat a senator is also voluntarily entering the political uh, arena. Why are their tender feelings any more worth protecting than the feelings of my two hundred dollar donor who has to be disclosed? Well. A couple of things there. I'm Senator. very worried about billionaires' feelings here. I, I got to tell sure. you, it's really, it's I'm touching. Sure, we all are. Uh, a couple of things. First, we have a secret ballot here in the United States. So when people go to vote, uh, their ballot is nobody's not talking about voting. We're public. talking about people entering the political arena by making a political contribution. And if they give me two hundred dollars, their name, address, and occupation is disclosed. If they give two hundred million dollars to a PAC, a super PAC. Uh, that has a name that nobody knows what it means, they can be hidden. What's the difference? How do I tell well, that, a person that, in Maine Senator, that, they, that they're, they have to be Senator. disclosed, but a billionaire in California who's trying to buy a Maine Senate seat doesn't have to be disclosed? How do I explain that? Well, there's, first of all, if the billionaire is given money to a super PAC, it is disclosed. It's those Not if it's out. through a 501c4 or one of these other phone well, that, That's, it, that's illegal. You can't, you can't. You can't give money to a third party and say, give it to this organization. That's a contribution in the name of another. So that's, that's, that's barred, and that's a criminal offense, and that's the sort of thing that I think the Justice Department would go after. But what I'm talking about here, and I think the real but the nub of your argument stuff. seems the nub of your argument, and Senator Haggerty mentioned this, is fear of harassment of people because they're disclosed. And the point is, if you take a public position in this country, there's no First Amendment right to anonymity. Uh, I once was, my highest political position before being governor of Maine was moderator of the Topsa Maine town meeting. Nobody can go to a town meeting in Maine with a bag over their head. The person who's making the statement, the, the identity of that person is part of the information that the voters need in order to assess the information, and that's what you're denying them. Well, look, we're not talking, the bill goes far beyond election uh, expenditures for independent expenditures and so-called electioneering communications. It would cover 365 days a year, whether it's an election year or not, and it would cover expenditures that uh, talk about important issues. And I think if we don't you think the American think people have a right to know who's trying to influence their their position on policy or on elections? Isn't that isn't that no, in the fact, information no, in that fact, they should have? No, in fact, I don't. And I think it's pretty clear during the civil rights movement. It was clear if people were behind the civil rights movement in the South, whether they were black or white or any other color, they uh, we're going to be subject to harassment or many, many, many worse things. It seems and to me there's look, a, diff uh, there's a difference. Me, Senator, between... let, me, let me finish answering, if I might. Just think back to even today in some states, if you're uh, a member uh, of an organization that fights for LGBTQ um, rights, you don't want to be disclosed necessarily in some of these very conservative states because you will face discrimination in hiring, or you may lose the job that you're at, or you may not get a job. And this is still very sensitive in some areas of the country. So I think it is very important that we have to consider there are going to be some very unpopular causes. It could be, say, for example, during the Vietnam War, when people were first against that, it was very unpopular. And I think we have to keep in mind that we have to protect minority viewpoints that may become majority viewpoints, and we can't try to suppress these um, ability for people to get their message across. And that's what this would, bill would do. And, and I understand the argument. About I understand the argument. I understand the NAACP case, but it seems to be there's a line where if you enter the political process by engagement in uh, candidate advocacy that that's a place where uh, the right of the public for the information contained by who is contributing overcomes the, yeah. the danger of, of uh, uh, harassment or, or, or intimidation. Uh, my time is up. Uh, Mr. Madam Chairman, thank you. Excellent. I think I'll be ceding my time to you more often, Senator King. Very good job. Uh, uh, Senator Haggerty. 
Thank you. Uh, Let me get my microphone on here. Mr. Keating, can I stay with you, please? Um, I want to talk about the chilling effects of donor disclosure that actually occur uh, under the Disclose Act. As I understand it, the Disclose Act would require groups engaged in political speech, like nonprofit groups, to disclose the names and addresses of their significant donors and their administrators. Is that correct? Yes. And then what would be the likely effect of requiring nonprofits and other groups to disclose the names and addresses of their supporters as this unfolds? Well, look, I think for the popular groups, um, they probably won't have much impact if they are concentrated in a particular geographic location, but even there, uh, they may see an impact. But I think for many, many groups, what we will see is groups will choose uh, perhaps a combination of two different things. One is their public communications will become far less effective because they won't uh, inform people who their members of Congress are or their senators, um, you know, to, to call on them to take action, whether it's, you know, passing something to restore abortion rights or to advocate for lower taxes, whatever issue it may be. And so they'll, they'll either make their communications less effective or what they'll find is they'll, they'll find that donors are just simply not going to be willing to give money. Now, we're not talking here, um, you know, as Senator King uh, mentioned, where do we draw the line? The answer is, I think, the Supreme Court drew the line. The line is when you're expressly advocating for a candidate or against a candidate, urging the election or defeat of a candidate, that's where the line should be drawn. And I think that when groups are advocating on policy for so social change, uh, for improving the United States through passing legislation or repealing bad laws, uh, we have to protect uh, the people that are advocating for these changes that are not the majority view yet. And that's why this bill is so overreaching in its impact. That's why the ACLU has expressed concerns. That's why the Alliance for Justice has expressed concerns. There's a lot of concern about this across the spectrum. A lot of the liberal groups, unfortunately, are not willing to speak out on this, uh, but I can tell you that a number of them are quite concerned about this legislation. Well, some of the aspects of the legislation I'd like to dig into a little bit more closely because the regulations themselves, I think, that would come from this legislation can be confusing and, and chill speech. Uh, first, I'd like to go to the PASO standard that determines whether the speech promotes, attacks, supports, or opposes the figure that, that, that's being either criticized or talked about, which is vague. It's impossible to objectively administer. Uh, think about the deceptive and coercive requirements like forcing groups to declare whether they support or oppose public officials, even if they do neither. And you think about the oppressive disclosure requirements that are required in order to even engage in, in, in political speech. You went through an example where 18 seconds of a 30-second ad would be eaten up just to meet the disclosure requirements, uh, wholly impractical. Um, let's take another example. We could be, take, take another real-life scenario like the one you proposed. Uh, but let's assume that a nonprofit, nonpartisan group were to spend $15,000 to run just 15 second local television ads urging their senators to do more to stand up for crime victims and tougher sentences for violent criminals. And let's say the group's funded mostly by family members of violent crime victims. Some of them may have made donations more than $10,000. Such an ad might be determined to fall under the new definition of applicable public communication, which incorporates the vague PASO standard. Is that correct? Absolutely, that's definitely correct. And if it's considered an applicable public communication, then this nonprofit group would have to declare whether it supports or opposes the senators it mentions, even if it doesn't in fact support or oppose them, and instead is just advocating for crime victims. Isn't that correct? That's correct. I mean, I think one of the problems with this legislation is it would force organizations and the federal government to publish misinformation. Uh, we've had, heard a lot of concern uh, publicly about misinformation, including from this body in the Senate, uh, the U.S. Senate, about misinformation. And here, here's a piece of legislation requiring groups uh, to report misinformation on public forums, which th would then be carried by the media. Uh, and that's not the only element of misinformation. A lot of the donors, so-called donors, that would be reported and associated with these ads, in fact, had never seen the ads, may not agree with the ads, but yet would be either published on the 
face of the ad itself or in public reports saying they financed it, which would be totally false in some instances. It's very troublesome. Thank you, Mr. Keating. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, next up, uh, Senator Padilla. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, not sure I'm following the train of thought in the previous answer to the previous question, but uh, let's move forward here. Uh, now, under the Disclose Act, organizations spending more than $10,000 on campaign-related activity would be required to disclose any donor who contributed more than $10,000, which is, in my opinion, a large sum of money, to fund that activity. Donors who give less than that amount would not need to be disclosed. So this sort of basic transparency would not affect small dollar donors, uh, but would reveal the small segment of society that is spending tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands, in some cases even millions of dollars, to influence the outcome of elections and, by extension, public policy. I think disclosure would also help voters uh, and citizens broadly understand who's trying to influence and why. Sounds like common sense policy. Now, those that seek to use their uh, uh, outsized uh, wealth to gain an outsized voice in elections and policy shouldn't be able to do so anonymously. Yet critics claim that forcing disclosure of these large donors will subject those individuals to harassment or danger. Mr. Weiner, I know we touched on this a few minutes ago, but can you respond to the specific criticism that donor disclosure will lead to donor harassment? Uh, of course. Thank you, Senator. Um, I think that we should start with a common premise, which is that everybody in our society deserves to be safe when they engage with the political process. Um, but I am mindful of Justice Scalia's admonition that requiring people to stand up in public for their political acts fosters civic courage, without which democracy is doomed. So yes, it is not acceptable to harass donors. It's not acceptable that violence is not acceptable. But the right to speak is not to the right to be speak free from criticism. And you know, we have had millions upon millions of Americans who have been subject to disclosure at the threshold for candidates. And Actual harassment and reprisals are rare. There is also, I would like to note, an exception in this legislation for donors who face a real threat to their safety as a result of donation. So I think in the vast majority of cases, no, this is not actually a, a serious concern and a good objection to disclosure. Okay. Thank you for that. I, uh, you know, before I ask my next question, which is specific to the Citizens United case, you know, I sort of take a step back and look at the impact, not just of Citizens United, but Shelby v. Holder, right? It seems that in the last decade, the Supreme Court has uh, specifically made it harder for some people to vote and easier for the wealthy to influence elections. Bad combination. Now, in Citizens United specifically, the Supreme Court uh, unleashed a torrent of unlimited political spending. Billions of dollars in the last 10 years on the basis of two assumptions, and correct me if I'm wrong, this analysis. Number one, that spending would be accompanied by both independence and transparency. The court reasoned that if expenditures were independent, then they would not necessarily lead to the undue influence or corruption. The court also reasoned that transparency would safeguard political integrity. So, Mr. Weiner, also for you, in the decades since the Citizens United decision, how have these two assumptions underlying the court's holding fared? Are independent expenditures actually independent and transparent? Well, thank you, Senator. No, they are not. Many, many, many independent expenditures are actually, of course, carried out by groups that have close, close ties to candidates. And what you see is also, obviously, fundraising for these groups with candidates and elected officials attending and even donors being able to lobby for their favored policies. And then, of course, as we've been discussing, neither are many of these expenditures transparent. So I think neither of those predictions, as sadly with many of the predictions in Shelby County, have um, proved to come to pass. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Thank you very much, Senator Padilla. Um, Senator Hyde-Smith is next. Is that correct? Okay. Thank you, Chairwoman. And uh, 
I also want to thank the panelists for being here today. Certainly appreciate that. And my question is directed to Mr. Keating. In your testimony, you stated that the Disclose Act would harm the rights of Americans guaranteed by the First Amendment to, free speak, to freely speak, publish, organize into groups, and petition. How significant are the risks to our First Amendment rights of free speech and association under the disclosure requirements in this legislation? Well, I think they're very significant. We would see a real atrophy of uh, national organizations being able to influence policy. I think there's actually a great deal of confusion about what is actually in this uh, proposal. Uh, just calling something a campaign-related disbursement doesn't make it a campaign-related disbursement. We're talking about uh, expenditures on uh, communications to the public that could be even a year or more away from election. It doesn't uh, do anything to urge anyone to vote for or against any particular candidate. And yet this bill would sweep that in. It's really a form of not only campaign finance, but it would be the first ever um, legislation to require disclosure for grassroots lobbying efforts. And this was uh, tried in the 1970s and it generated a huge amount of opposition across the political spectrum. And I think if there was understanding about that today, uh, and in fact, I think if there was a danger of this actually becoming law, I think a lot of groups would emerge and say, look, we're all in favor of disclosure for actual campaigning for or against candidates. But what we're not in favor of here is advocating on important public issues. And whether you're on the left or on the right, um, there are going to be causes that are minority viewpoints where people are simply not going to be willing uh, to write a check or make a, a donation uh, to support an unpopular cause. Uh, it could be because where they live, uh, it's unpopular or could be unpopular throughout the country. So I think, I, I really fear if uh, if this bill becomes law over time, over decades, it will make it far more difficult uh, for minority viewpoints to appeal to our fellow Americans to say, look, rethink things. Um, we need to make these changes nationally. So I, I would encourage the the supporters of this to take a look at the bill and to try to draw a better line between what's actually campaign related and what is actually pushing for uh, improving our government. Thank you. And also, Mr. Keatings, what are the risks associated with publicly disclosing the names and all of this personal information on donors to super PACs considering the growing risk associated with the cancel culture in this country in which individuals, businesses, or organizations are targeted with protests or threats of positions that they might would take? Well, look, I think it's already a problem right now. And I think there are many people who, I mean, look, there are millions of people that give to candidates, but I think there are millions more that don't. And the reason why they don't is because they, they are smart enough to know if they give over $200 or if they give through Act Blue or Win Red, even like $1, their name will be on the internet forever and associated with that candidate. Uh, if that candidate becomes an elected official, everything good or bad that candidate has ever done. So I think we're already seeing some uh, suppression. I think a lot of small donors are simply not w willing to step forward to support candidates and parties. But I really fear that if we expand this to advocacy on issues, as this proposal would do, uh, we're going to see it very difficult uh, to push for legislation to improve our government over time, over many years and many decades. Thank you, and I think everybody agrees we all want fair and free elections, but uh, other members of the panel see more than willing to embrace a broad expansion of complex financial disclosure requirements outlined in the Disclose Act. In your view, could the goals of this legislation be accomplished without infringing on First Amendment rights and a tangle of new bureaucratic mandates? Well, look, I, 
there are many different goals that have been expressed, so I'm not really sure what the goals are. I think if the, if the goals were more clearly and narrowly stated, such as if money is given for independent expenditures, um, that should be disclosed. If that's the goal, then yes, I think you could do some things that would come a lot closer uh, to that goal without infringing on First Amendment rights as this bill does. But the bill doesn't do that. And, you know, it doesn't do the other things. Uh, it doesn't address the other things about so-called independence uh, that one of my colleagues on the panel has, has spoken about. Thank you. My time has expired. Thank you, Senator. Uh, I'm going to ask my questions uh, now, and then I'm going to turn over uh, the hearing to Senator Merkley. Um, and I thank him for his leadership in this area. So I'm going to uh, start with kind of asking you, Mr. Weiner, that question that uh, Senator Hyde Smith asked of Mr. Keating, and that is, are the goals being accomplished here? I just kind of look at it a very different way, and that is that the goals aren't being accomplished if there's over a billion dollars in secret money and we don't know who is spending it and who the donors are. Yeah, Go ahead. Th <clears throat> thank you, Senator. I, I would say the goals are being accomplished and I would actually say this is quite tailored legislation. No, I mean without the legislation. That was the question. Like, are we finding out enough information ah, without I, this? Yeah, mm -hmm. I understand. Ex apologies. No, I wasn't clear. I would say we are not. Again, we have seen more than a billion dollars in secret spending just in the last election cycle. I want to address one thing that Senator King raised. Yes. The FEC data about dark money is grossly under-inclusive. It does not include transfers to other organizations, which is the increasing trend to so do donations to super PACs, nor does it include a lot of undisclosed electoral spending like on the internet. So without this legislation, no, we are not addressing these goals. We are seeing large and growing amounts of spending not being disclosed. And to clarify again something that Mr. Keating talked about, the focus of this bill is related to campaigns and candidates. And if there are issue ads, it's related to candidates. Is that correct? Yes, Senator. And I would note that um, the, the standard that Mr. Keating was referring to is about promoting, supporting, attacking, or opposing the election of a candidate. My position, and I'm not a member of the FEC, is that this bill would not cover, and I think it's pretty clear, issue advocacy that mentions a candidate. There would have to be an, an electoral reference. It is about the election, not just about the individual office holder. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Solomon, time and time again, um, I think about and see the numbers on how people have been losing trust in elected officials and in institutions. Uh, involved in government. I think it's really disturbing for a democracy, no matter what political party you belong to. League of Women Voters has always been a uh, mission, is to uh, support our democracy, hold debates, uh, support civility in our politics. When people see outside groups drowning out the voices of voters, how does that impact their desire to vote and participate in our democracy? Well, thank you, Senator. Um, I would say that um, the influx of big and secret money makes it hard for voters to feel like they can compete, quite frankly, when their voice isn't necessarily being heard, it's being drowned out um, by special interests. And I would say another thing that is quite frustrating we hear from, from voters is that um, most people can't e don't even have $400 to get to the next paycheck if some kind of an emergency arrives, right? But yet some can contribute more than $10,000, have a contribution to what decisions are being made, who's being elected to office, and they don't have the ability to know who those individuals are who are influencing their votes. And so there's so much confusion that has been created as a result of non-disclosure that it only um, furthers the mis and distrust that exists now today among many um, average American voters. Okay, very good. Thank you. Good answer. Um, Commissioner Mangan, there you are out in Montana where we all wish we were right now. Um, could you address um, that legislation that you passed in 2015 with bipartisan support, which actually requires the disclosure of donors uh, to outside groups spending money in Montana state and local elections. I, I just find this so interesting because 
um, you know, I, I have a feeling that the world didn't fall down there when you did that. You got bipartisan support, and as I pointed out, in our own country, traditionally, we've had bipartisan support for disclosure, and even these incredibly conservative Supreme Court justices in the Citizens United um, opinion uh, voiced uh, their belief that it is constitutional to have this kind of disclosure. So could you talk about how Montana was able to find bipartisan agreement to address the secret money in the elections and how have Montanans responded to that? Well, thank you, Senator. And, and of course, you're all always welcome to come visit Montana. <laughs> I can see the sun. Maybe that sun coming in. All right. Keep going. You know, the I can only speak to Montana, and during that time before the Disclose Act, the Citizens United and a number of local issues in Montana uh, where there were unattributed um, uh, ads uh, attacking uh, candidates uh, of both parties, um, they had enough is enough, and, and the Montana legislators got together, worked together, and crafted the Disclose Act with both Republicans and, and Democrats. And it's been successful in Montana because Montanans want that disclosure and they want to be able to know who's spending money and who's influencing uh, their democracy. And we've just come to expect it, I think. And uh, uh, while it's only, of course, from local to statewide races, um, we hear those questions about federal races as well. And of course, we can't answer them. Exactly. So probably a good last question for me is about that, that your act, of course, because of your jurisdiction, only applies to state and local elections. And it seems to me that leaves a major gap in the disclosure requirements uh, for, for any kind of uh, ads or other activity related to elections in federal elections. And could you talk about that complete I think absurd uh, disparity because of the amount of money that's spent in federal elections um, and um, how you believe that should be closed as a loophole for your citizens, no matter what party they're in. They get to find out how people are spending money on state and local, but oops, not for the federal government. They can, the, those elections can be, anyone can donate to anything and spend money and you're never gonna know what it is. Uh, thank you, Senator. Uh, we're, you know, we're fortunate in Montana that I get to talk to candidates, committees, and citizens um, every day on on this very subject. And while a, a committee um, or a candidate um, for a local school election or a school levy, for example, um, would have to disclose those over fifty dollar uh, uh, contributions, um, those folks do have do ask about why we don't see that in in federal races um, when folks are spending um, thousands and millions of dollars yet at, on a small local race, um, the stuff that they want to see, they want to know who's you know, involved in their in their, uh, their community's elections. They don't see that on a, uh, on a larger scale and it's a question that we can't answer, unfortunately. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. Uh, Senator Cruz is up next and I'll turn the gavel over to uh, Senator Merkley. Senator Cruz. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. There was a time when Democrats supported free speech. There was a time when members across the aisle actually believed in the First Amendment. Unfortunately, that time has long since passed. In 2014, Congress considered an amendment from Democrats to repeal the free speech provisions of the First Amendment. I was at the time the ranking member on the Senate Constitution Subcommittee, the Judiciary Committee. I led the fight against it. Ultimately, that amendment came to a vote on the Senate floor. And every single Senate Democrat voted to repeal the free speech protections of the First Amendment. Sure, it, it was a vote that would have given Congress plenary power to regulate. The initial version was to regulate any and all political speech by anyone. It literally would have said any expenditure of money for political speech. So it would have said that if a little old lady went to Home Depot and spent $5 to buy a, yard, a, a cardboard sign and a stick to say, vote the bum out, that Congress could make it a felony and put her in jail. It also could have met, given Congress the ability to criminalize union organizing the Democrats realized that that version of the amendment was too extreme even for them, so there was a second version that Senator Durbin offered 
that limited its restrictions only to corporations. However, it had plenary authority to any political speech by a corporation. Now, I'll point out Paramount Pictures is a corporation, Simon & Schuster is a corporation, NBC is a corporation, the NAACP is a corporation, Planned Parenthood is a corporation, the Brennan Center is a corporation. Under the proposed amendment, Congress would have had blanket authority to regulate any and all political speech by any corporation in America. It was blatantly unconstitutional, and every single Democrat voted for it when it was voted on the floor. There was a time, by the way, previously when Democrats tried to repeal the First Amendment to the Constitution, the free speech protections, there were a handful of lions of the Senate that spoke out against it. Russ Feingold courageously spoke out against it. Ted Kennedy gave a floor speech saying, we haven't amended the Bill of Rights in over 200 years, and now is no time to start. I gave a floor speech with a picture of Ted Kennedy behind me, nearly scared my father to death when he saw me on TV with Ted Kennedy behind me. But I pleaded, is there not one Ted Kennedy on the Democratic side who believes in free speech? There wasn't a single one. Unfortunately, with this bill, that is combined by the recent willingness of the left to engage in threats of violence and intimidation against speech they, we, they don't like. We saw that with Antifa and Black Lives Matter riots all across this country, with Democrat politicians turning a blind eye that culminated in the current Vice President of the United States, Kamala Harris, raising money to bail out of jail violent rioters threatening fellow citizens. We saw it just recently with a leak of a draft decision of the Supreme Court and then left-wing groups publishing the addresses of Supreme Court justices and violent rioters going to the homes of Supreme Court justices and the Biden Department of Justice refusing to enforce federal criminal law that makes it a crime to protest at the home of a justice. But our Attorney General Merrick Garland refuses to enforce that law. And the result of that, as we saw just weeks ago, a deranged man arrested for the attempted murder of Justice Brett Kavanaugh. That is truly a toxic stew of the current Democrats' unwillingness to protect free speech and willingness to engage in violence and threats of violence against their political enemies. What does that mean for something like the Disclose Act? Well, we saw in California in 2008 when there was a referendum on the ballot in support of traditional marriage, and a majority of Californians, bright blue California, voted in support of traditional marriage, and the names of those contributors were outed, and left-wing groups published their home addresses, and people got fired for their job for, by the way, contributing to what was then the political position of people like Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton. And yet people got fired for their jobs to daring to speak out. Look, the landmark case on this is NAACP versus Patterson. In that case, the state of Alabama, run by Democrats, wanted to target the people that were members of the NAACP. They wanted to go after them and persecute them. Sadly, it was the Democrats that founded the Klan, and they wanted to go after the NAACP. That case went to the Supreme Court in 1958, and the Supreme Court unanimously ruled that the NAACP, you couldn't force them to hand over their membership lists because it violates their, their First Amendment rights of free association. This Disclose Act is designed to target and harass speech that the left doesn't like. It is bla blazingly unconstitutional. I will mention something, though, to my Democratic colleagues. My time's expired, but I will say, if you want to see more disclosure, and if you think the current system is idiotic, and I think the current system of super PACs is idiotic, every year in Congress I've introduced legislation called the Super PAC Elim Elimination Act. It would do two very simple things. It would, number one, allow unlimited individual contributions to campaigns, not corporations, not unions, individuals. And number two, it would require immediate 24-hour disclosure of any contributions. It doesn't ban super PACs, but as a practical matter, they would fade away because every candidate would rather control their own message rather than some other group. And yet, I've yet to get a Democrat willing to support it. I, I want to ask, I, I apologize, one question if I could ask Mr. Weiner. The Brennan Center supports transparency and disclosure 
over the, over the existence of the Brennan Center, how much money has been given to the Brennan Center, specifically by George Soros? Senator, I don't know how much money specifically, but I will say that... Will you answer it if what I ask you in writing? Senator will be happy to respond, but I just want to a say that I will happily acknowledge that Open Society Foundation is a Brennan Center donor, and we are proud that they have donated to but us. Will you, answer the, will you answer the question or give me a lawyerly dodge? Because we, we both know how to do both of those. Senator, we'll be happy to respond to a request. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator Cruz. I want to uh, uh, turn to you, Ms. Solomon. We heard earlier that the current climate uh, has, um, if you will, intimidated small donors from participation. If we look at the participation of small donors over the last decade, has participation grown or declined? So small dollar donors, um, I would say, has slightly increased over the past decade. Um, so I don't think that it necessarily excludes small dollar donors. What I would like to say is that um, small dollar donors feel that they don't have the same level of impact. If you're contributing $25 or $75 or $100, and as opposed to somebody who's contributing $25,050, $1 million, who do you think people feel that their elected officials will pay more attention to? And so the question, I think, is important, but it's also the fact that these large donations drown out the small dollar donors as individuals, and they feel like they have less power in deciding what happens to our country. Ms. Solomon, I, I think you've stated it very well. I think the numbers of small donors have actually increased very significantly over the last decade. It's not that they're reluctant to participate. They're participating in significant numbers, uh, but they are concerned that whereas they might be able to donate $25 or 100 or maybe 200 and be disclosed, that there are groups out there that contribute millions of dollars and that those folks are going to get a lot more attention from members of Congress. Ms. Solomon, as we think about the principle of government of, by, and for the people, the whole idea that power flows up from the people, Having power flow down from massive corporations uh, in massive donations, is that a conflict with the fundamental uh, premise of our democratic republic? I believe that it does. It's a huge conflict. And I think um, part of the challenge that we face as a country, quite honestly, is that the lack of trust in government has increased so, so significantly because of a lack of transparency. Um, people question the, the motivations behind decisions that are being made by their elected leaders. And that's concerning. When, when elected leaders, their integrity is questioned, we can all agree that we're going to disagree, right? We know that happens in this building every single day. But the lack of trust is so great at this point that people are actually questioning the integrity of their elected leaders. Are they good people? Are they bad people? How are they influencing the election? And they believe that oligarchs and corporations are influencing your decisions. And that doesn't feel good. Yeah. Thank you. And Mr. Weiner, we, we heard before that it's easy to draw a distinction between ads that advocate for a policy and ads that are campaign involved. Uh, this uh, ad broadens, this uh, act, this CLOSE Act, broadens communications that to, broadens to communications for disclosure that promote, attack, support, or oppose a candidate. It doesn't broaden it to, as I understand it, to policy advocacy. Is, am, I, am I correct in, in that reading? Yes, yeah, Senator, you are correct. And it, in fact, it, it, it's the election of a candidate. So I would say that there has to be a reference to an election and there has to be the promotion of electoral result. Um, and, and I do think that that's a crucial distinction that narrows the scope of the bill. Why is it, uh, why is it legitimate, Mr. Weiner, for us to ask for disclosure when an ordinary citizen donates more than $200? Well, I think, Senator, that, you know, disclosure arms the voting public with information and that we've long understood that 
candidates and others should disclose the sources of their funding and that that, that was an appropriate threshold for that. Um, I think that, and again, you know, I come back to the words of Justice Scalia that, that requiring people to stand up for their public acts fosters civic courage without which democracy is doomed. And I think that is a well-established norm in our political process and one that has become very important to the integrity of our elections. And uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Mangan, um, Montana, I recall at one point was controlled by the, I believe the proper term was the Copper Kings. And the citizens of the state said, this is, this is, this is wrong. We need to have our government, be, our state government controlled by the people. Uh, and uh, so it's a particular uh, e example. Uh, and does it therefore make sense that if you will, uh, candidates in Montana, um, the individual donations of their campaign over $200 are disclosed but if an independent campaign uh, receives massive donations, uh, uh, that those donations can come directly from a, a, a very, very powerful uh, corporation. Well, in Montana, um, of course, uh, citizens have, have uh, you know, voiced um, their feelings very strongly. And you know, we haven't seen the type of backlash uh, that's been discussed here today. Um, and we've had disclosure uh, uh, for a number of years on both election and electioneering communications. Uh, as far as uh, uh, any local races or statewide races, uh, all donors are required, over $250 or more, are required um, in, uh, in for committees to, to file and report uh, uh, contributions and expenditures. It's as simple as that. Um, and, you know, my tenants have embraced that. Um, and again, we haven't seen any backlash, um, as far as, you know, the things that we've, we've heard today, um, in Montana, um, it's just the opposite. Um, my tenants come to expect it and want that disclosure. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator King. I just want to follow up very briefly with, with Senator Cruz. I, I think he makes an interesting proposal. I would argue that we have what he proposed, except we don't have the disclosure. We have unlimited contributions. The system we have now, you can give an unlimited contribution through one of these dark money vehicles, but all, the only thing we don't have is disclosure. His, his position, I remember him stating it some years ago, unlimited individual contributions and full disclosure. And I think we have unlimited full, we have unlimited contributions, we just don't have disclosure. Uh, Mr. Keating, I think we have more agreement than, than might appear because as I read the bill, and I, I would hope you will supply perhaps after the hearing more detail, but this bill is very narrowly targeted to candidate elections. It's not about issue advocacy. The, the, the principal uh, provision, Section 324, any covered organization that makes campaign-related disbursements, and then you go back uh, several sections later, and it defines campaign-related disbursements, and it says an independent expenditure which expressly advocates the election or defeat of a clearly identified candidate for election for federal office, or is the functional equivalent of express advocacy because when taken as a whole, it can be interpreted by a reasonable person only as advocating the election or defeat of a candidate election for federal office. That's, the, that's what we're talking about here. We're not talking about uh, a, an LGBTQ group putting a, a, an ad on TV generally talking about general, gender equality. We're talking about advocacy of candidates. Am I, am I reading the statute wrong? Is there a provision? It also talks, I know, about an applicable public communication, but that's also defined. It refers to a clearly identified candidate for election for federal office and which promotes or supports the election of a candidate for that office. So it looks like what you're, what you're arguing against, which is issue advocacy, isn't covered by this bill. Am, am, I, am I misreading the bill? Yes, I think you are. I think, uh, I'll give you an example. I'm going to read you an actual ad uh, that a three-judge panel of the uh, District of Columbia Court uh, ruled uh, 
was an ad that could be interpreted as taking a position, I'm quoting from the court's ruling, taking a position against the identified candidate. Here's the ad. Let the punishment fit the crime. But for many federal crimes, that's no longer true. Unfair laws tie the hands of judges with huge increases in prison costs that help drive up the debt. And for what purpose? Studies show that these laws don't cut crime. In fact, soaring costs from these laws make it harder to prosecute and lock up violent felons. Fortunately, there's a bipartisan bill to help fix this problem, the Justice Safety Valve Act, Bill Number 619. It would allow judges to keep the public safe, provide rehabilitation, and deter others from committing crimes. Paul Senators Michael Bennett and Mark Udall at 202-224-3121. Tell them to support S-619, the Justice Safety Valve Act. Tell them it's time to let the punishment fit the crime. Now, that court looked at that bill and said uh, that uh, advertisement and said it could be construed as taking a position um, against the candidate because the, presumably the, the group wouldn't have run the ad asking the uh, two senators from Colorado to uh, come out in support of the bill or support the bill. So, look, well, it seems if, to me I mean, if we're talking about express advocacy for a candidate, we don't need the PASO standard, the standard that you read, no other reasonable interpretation uh, is sufficient. And the question would be, what does this PASO standard mean if it doesn't mean that? And that's the problem. No one knows what it means. No one knows where the line is. If we can better draw the line, if we can uh, make the definition tighter, do I understand you to say that you have no objection to the to the revelation of the identity of donors to clearly what we would all agree would be political advocacy of a particular candidate for or against? Well, again, it depends on the details and, you know, the exact language and the rest of the structure of the but bill. Assume for a moment we could draft the language that would narrowly tailor it strictly to elections and, and political candidates. Would that, uh, would that be satisfactory to you? Well, look, we're not going to come out in favor of it, <laughs> but I can tell you it's certainly possible to draw this in a more narrow fashion that I think will find broader support and have less impact on our First Amendment rights uh, to join groups and speak to fellow Americans. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Senator I think that's King. an important point. Uh, it is indeed. And uh, we didn't hear that that he would necessarily, his organization would not support it, even if it was narrowly drafted, but he would see it as an improvement, as I gathered. Um, while I have you all here as experts, I wanted to ask a little bit about the uh, corporate role in our campaigns. And um, a few years ago, I asked my team to look at the form of corporations uh, when our nation was founded, when our constitution was written, and whether there was anything resembling the modern corporation. And um, they reported there, there were um, chartered corporations for specific purposes, but nothing resembling the structure of the modern corporation. Would you all agree with that, Ms. Solomon and Mr. Weiner? Yes, sir. Yes. So I found it very interesting. The court said, you know, a corporation is a person. Now, they also often talk about explicit words in the Constitution when they're holding an originalist conversation. Does the word corporation appear in the free speech clause of the Constitution? No, Senator. Is there any kind of an indication anywhere uh, in the discussion uh, about freedom of speech and the, 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 the federal papers, for example, federalist papers, um, that a chartered corporation, even of that type that existed in 1787, is the equivalent of a person or should have free speech powers? Not that I'm aware of, sir. Not that I'm aware of. So the, the court says that, the Supreme Court has said, so, 
Uh, this group of individuals represented by this corporation has an interest in expressing its viewpoint in our society and should have the full protection to, uh, to do so. And I assume they're referring to the group of the owners of the, of the corporation, and those are stockholders. Do stockholders have complete power over what the group says? Do they vote on what the group says in public discourse? Is it their speech, the stockholder's speech, or is it simply speech chosen by the corporate officers? Well, Senator, um, very often stockholders have very little control over the speech. It's their money, but it is not actually a uh, speech that they can control. Is it not the case that stockholders sometimes ask the corporation, as an owner, I should have the right to know how you're spending money, and the corporation officers uh, say, hell no. In fact, often corporations spend money diametrically opposed to the views and the values of their stockholders. So how can this be the speech of the corporation if uh, it's actually speech in which the owners disagree and don't, are not even given the privilege of knowing what's being said? Well, so, Senator, I think what you're getting at is, is that the, the framers of the Constitution could not have envisioned the uh, form of corporations have taken, and the fiction that a corporation is speaking for its stockholders is just that. It's often a fiction. So I think about... Can I say something about this? Well, uh, if I ask you a question, you, you can. Okay. Uh, well, I thought you were asking a question to the panel. Sorry. Uh, no, I'm not. I'm asking uh, Mr. Uh, Weiner and Ms. Solomon uh, because they know something about this. Uh, and uh, so I, I struggle with uh, the point that you made, Ms. Solomon, that ordinary citizens feel like their modest donations are outweighed by a extraordinary ability of companies, corporations that have billions of dollars of assets, not millions or tens of millions, billions. Sometimes our corporate profits are, are in the multi-digit billions. Uh, and that that type of concentration of power, and then it's not even the owners of the corporation, it is simply the officers who are deciding what is being said. So they're kind of stealing the speech from the owners. That this amplification, and you, I think you use the word, drowns out the advocacy of ordinary Americans. Have I captured your sentiment? Yes, sir, and I would add that it also creates a chilling effect on voters who think that their vote doesn't matter. And in fact, if an individual has an independent campaign on their behalf that is spending tens of millions of dollars, and the rest of their donors are, are spending $25, $100, who is that elected leader going to pay the most attention to? Those who are making the greatest investment in their success, and that would be getting elected. We just had a race in Oregon where a, um, a PAC decided to put $10 million into a primary for a member of Congress, an individual who has not served in any local office, but it was a Bitcoin billionaire uh, that decided, I want this guy elected. Uh, and um, it certainly seemed to me like citizens had the right to know where that millions of dollars of campaign ads were coming from to understand who was behind it. They, they, like they should have the right to know that a Bitcoin billionaire was trying to get somebody elected with no political experience because they thought that person would be a Bitcoin advocate. Doesn't, isn't that relevant to the debate in the, in the public square where you have an exchange of ideas and people have to stand up and, and own their, their advocacy? And shouldn't the citizens of Oregon get to know? In this case, they did know, but because it was publicized, but shouldn't they have the right to know who is behind these massive sums in our campaign? Absolutely, and I think one of the things, I know there was a comment earlier, I believe from Senator Cruz, who talked about cancel culture and people fearing being canceled. I would say there is a huge difference between canceling somebody and accountability. And you just can't say or do anything without being held accountable for the results of those words, actions, investments. And so um, I think it's, 
it continues to um, sit upon those of us who are voters, who maybe don't work on the Hill, who aren't elected officials, who just really care about knowing who's investing in our elections, who's making decisions on our behalf. And we don't want it to be corporations. We want to be able to have voice over our vote. Um, I think Shirley Chisholm says it best when she talks about being, when she spoke about being unbossed and unbought. The American people want elected leaders who are unbossed and unbought. You know, I was thinking about that difference you're de describing and going back to this example in Oregon. Uh, the um, Voters who found out that this massive ads were being funded by a Bitcoin billionaire, that didn't cancel the Bitcoin billionaire's voice. That voice was expressed like every single ad break on every single channel. It, there was no cancellation at all. But there was accountability in that, that people then knew because of the publicity through newspapers, not because the ad said this is being funded by this Bitcoin billionaire. Uh, but because, fortunately, the newspapers explain that, and people were like, oh, that explains where, that, where that's coming from. Mr. Weiner, did you want to weigh in on this? Well, Senator, I really just want to echo uh, Ms. Solomon's point and, and say that, you know, these are always questions of balance. And we, we've also heard a lot about the NAACP today, which was, of course, the victim of a campaign of racial terrorism in the South, in the Jim Crow South. The reality is, like this law, uh, this proposed legislation, there will always be situations where we need to balance privacy with the public's right to know. But the legislation here and the general principle that the people who fund campaign spending should be disclosed to the public is well accepted in our law and in our traditions and is really integral, I think, to what it means to have a political system with integrity. You know, earlier there was an implication that it's unconstitutional to require uh, disclosure. But did not the Supreme Court say in what I think was an extraordinarily uh, corrupt decision of Citizens United that, that favors government by the powerful over representative government by the people, a complete inversion of the design of our Constitution. Nonetheless, even in that case, did not the majority uh, assume uh, that there would be disclosure. I would say that the disclosure holding was integral to the ruling in Citizens United. It was integral to whatever, however flawed it may have been, the court's vision of how our campaign finance system should be structured. And the fact that we have yet to make good on the port's promise of you know, meaningful disclosure is, is a, a really a grave problem for our political system. I want to thank... Uh, all of you for coming to testify and share your, your experiences and your knowledge uh, before the Senate. Uh, this is such an important discussion to the future of our democracy. It's such an important question as to the integrity of our elections and the vision of government of, by, and for the people, not the, the powerful. The hearing record will remain open for one week and we are adjourned. Thank you.